All right, Romans chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Paul says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, saying, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. I want to share with you today from these words of Paul, and my message is entitled, Lessons from the Father of Our Faith. Lessons from the Father of Our Faith. Let's pray together, and as we pray now for the ministry of the word, I wonder if you would also join me in a moment of prayer for our nation. How many of you know that America needs to be touched in its soul by the hands of Jesus. Would you pray and even maybe bow your heads with me and let's ask God to touch the soul of our nation. Dear Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus today, Lord God. We thank you, Father, that because of Jesus, your door is always open to us and you invite us. You encourage us to come boldly, you say, to the throne of grace and obtain the grace and the help that we need in the time of need. And Father, that's us today, Lord God, in our nation. Father, we come boldly to your presence asking you for peace, Lord, and for reconciliation and for justice, Lord, in America. Father, we ask that you would let love and brotherhood flourish. Father, let it flourish through us through the equality that we share in Christ Jesus. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that your holy word tells us that you have made all men to be of one blood. And Lord, your word shows us a picture of the heavenly worship. And Lord, you say that in heaven above, you are being worshiped even now, God, by men of every nation and tribe and tongue and language, Lord. And we thank you that at harvest time, you've given us a glimpse of that heaven here, Father, as here gathered before you in this house, even, Lord, right now, there are people, Lord, from every corner of this world that you've made. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to walk in love toward one another. Lord, we ask that you would help us to maintain the beautiful unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Father, would you help us as we go outside the four walls of the church, would you help us to be agents and to be carriers of the love of Jesus Christ, Lord, and give testimony of who he is and what he can do for people's hearts. Father, we're bold now to ask you for a revival and a great awakening in our nation. Come on, would you just, without me praying, would you lift your voice to the Lord for a few moments and just ask him to send revival and awakening to America today. Lord, be merciful. Jesus, Father, have mercy. Lord, move by your spirit. Father, we pray, Lord, as the people of God, Lord, as priests of your heavenly kingdom, that you would speak, we ask you, to the hearts of our leaders. Your word says that the king's heart is like water in your hand, and you turn it, Lord, in whatever direction you desire. So we pray, Lord, for our federal leaders, our state leaders, our local leaders. And, Lord, we pray, Lord, that there would be righteousness in the land and wisdom given to them. Father, what the enemy has meant for evil, 
evil, Father, would you turn it for good? Father, because we declare that you are the only God who can redeem, who can bring something good out of something that is broken, out of something that the enemy means for evil. Father, glorify your name in our nation, we pray, Father. And Lord, as we look into the word of the Lord together today, we ask you to touch our own hearts now. Let our hearts be good soil, God, that can receive and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. So Holy Spirit, please come and minister life to us now from the scriptures. If you agree with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, church, we've been working our way through the opening chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans, and we've been looking at his explanation of the gospel of Christ. Paul's been skillfully demonstrating that all people, no matter what their background, have been separated from God because of sin. And whether Jew or Gentile, we have all gone astray. And Paul's taught us that by nature, we are not seeking for God, nor are we seeking to please him. Because sin cuts us off from a holy God, each one of us, whoever we are, finds himself in need of God's righteousness, God's forgiveness. We find ourselves in need of the help of God, his grace, if we're to have any possibility of coming back into right standing with him. Last week, Pastor Glenn brought us to the end of chapter 3, and he was sharing with us there a passage of scripture that's been called the very heart of the gospel. It's even been called the greatest paragraph ever written. And in that section of his letter, Paul says that God has now revealed to us a way to be righteous that is outside of law, has nothing to do with law. It is a righteousness from God that comes in a different way to people. It comes through having faith in Jesus Christ. We read in chapter 3 that everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we can be put into right relationship with God again by his grace, Paul says, because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Pastor shared with us how the cross is God's solution for several different problems that the human race faces. And let me recap them for you very quickly. First, the cross solves the problem of sin. It brings about our justification. And justification is a word that means more than simply forgiveness. It's a change in our status. God sees us in Christ, and he considers Jesus' righteousness to be our own. When God justifies us, he's declaring that we are just as we place our faith in Jesus. And second, the cross solves the problem of justice. It brings about propitiation. A propitiation is a sacrifice that takes away wrath. And on the cross, God expended his wrath, not against us who deserved it, but against Jesus Christ who did not. 700 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about his sufferings. Maybe there's a precious Jewish friend here today or listening. You need to know that 700 years before Jesus came, the Hebrew prophet Isaiah foretold the one who would receive God's wrath in the place of others. And Isaiah said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned aside every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus willingly endured God's punishment for sin. He was willing to be my substitute. And to bear the wrath of God in my place so that when I accept his blood as payment for my sin, instead of seeking to pay the price of my own sin myself, then I can go free. God can pardon you and still be just because someone has paid the price for sins that you and I committed. Third, the cross solves the problem of world religions. It does this by being a demonstration 
The cross was God's ultimate demonstration of love for us. And at the same time, the ultimate demonstration of his justice, that he must punish sin. God places the cross of his son before the eyes of all mankind, no matter what religion they are, no matter what they believe. And it says to us, the cross says, my son is the only remedy for your sin. Finally, the cross solves the problem of antinomianism. That's a word that's too big, but it's the belief that there's no law. In other words, we can do whatever we want. Anything goes. The cross does this by showing us that God's requirements are so high, so lofty, that breaking them required the death of God's own son to open the door of salvation. Now God sends the Holy Spirit to us so that we can live a life that is pleasing to God, not by our own strength, but by the strength of the Holy Spirit inside of us. The way that we receive each one of those marvelous blessings is by faith, simply reaching out and receiving what God is kindly offering to us without our being able to add anything to it. Now, church, as we move on into chapter 4, I think you saw from our scripture reading that Paul is sharing some deep truths, and he's making some deep arguments. Church, this is not the milk of the word. This is some of the meat of the word that we're looking at today. How many of you know that in the Bible there's some milk? And I think there's some veggies, too. And thank God, how many of you know there's a lot of dessert? in the word of God, right? There's some wonderfully sweet and precious promises that God has given us. But church, we need to know that there's also some meat we have to have to make us strong in our understanding of the gospel. So is it okay if we look at some meat today, some deep things? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay, you're gonna have dessert later. So as we look into chapter 4, Paul now is continuing to defend and explain the gospel. Now several times again, you might have noticed, he's done this by posing a question, a hypothetical question that maybe was being asked by someone who was opposed to the gospel message. And at the beginning of chapter 4, Paul is anticipating an objection from somebody, probably a Jewish opponent of his message, someone who is asking Paul, saying, Paul, you're saying that people are justified by faith and not by works. But what about Abraham? How was Abraham declared to be righteous? And I find in chapter 4 there are four important gospel lessons for us from Abraham's story. He's the father of our faith, and we need to look at those lessons from our father. Four lessons from the father of our faith. And the first one is this. Even the best of us must be justified by faith, not by works. Even the best of us must be justified by faith, not by works. In verses 1 and 2, Paul says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Because if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Abraham, of course, was the father of the Jewish people. And although his faith was certainly great, by the time of Paul... Abraham had become for people a larger than life figure. He had become a man of such tremendous accomplishments in their minds that the idea of even trying to imitate Abraham was a bit of a stretch. The Jewish view of Abraham had become actually legendary and they glossed over the human failings which uh, actually ironically are what make Abraham's faith very beautiful and impressive. Jewish writers praised Abraham and taught about him in ways that were unbiblical and actually even ridiculous. Some Jewish writers said that Abraham was perfect in everything that he did. Now, those of you who have been studying Genesis with me on Wednesday nights know that these folks would never have said that if they could have spoken to Sarah just one time. <laughs> Some writers said that Abraham was so righteous 
that he kept the whole law of Moses, which was a pretty good feat considering it wouldn't be written for another 500 years. Other people said that Abraham was so holy that he had no need of repentance. So as you can see, Abraham had become someone in their minds who was virtually idolized. But how did Abraham come to be in right standing with God? How was Abraham approved? What was the basis of his relationship with God? People who held those inflated beliefs about Abraham would have said that he was justified by his works. They would have said that Abraham's merits, his good deeds, had caused God to declare him a righteous man. Abraham was the father of the nation, and so they might have said we should follow his example and try to be justified by works also as they thought that he had been. Paul disagrees. He's already said to us in chapter 3 that people are justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And Paul says that no one can boast. But what about someone like Abraham? The man that Jews considered the supreme example of friendship with God. You know that in the Bible, Abraham is the only person who's called the friend of God. And that's pretty good. If opponents of the gospel could show that Abraham was justified by works, well, then maybe it was possible for other people also to become acceptable to God by their own efforts. And if that were the case, Paul's message, Paul's gospel would be fatally wounded. And now, as Paul often does, we're going to see him taking those very arguments of the adversaries of the gospel and using them against them. What if Paul could actually show that even Abraham was made righteous by faith alone, faith in God's mercy, and without any of his merits, any of Abraham's merits tipping the scales in his favor? If Paul could show that even Abraham was justified by faith, and not by works, he would be proving conclusively that no one can boast before God and that everyone must come by the way that God has made, which is by Jesus Christ. In verses 2 and 3, now Paul begins to lay out this argument. He says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Every Jewish person who studied the Bible on any level knew that God had credited righteousness to Abraham's account. He considered him righteous from that point forward. Paul will now show his opponents that they did not really understand what that meant. He's going to demonstrate the truth of the gospel by showing his adversaries that they did not really understand what Abraham did or when it happened. What was it that Abraham did? Paul's quoting here from Genesis chapter 15. And when we look back in Genesis 15, we see that Abraham is in a kind of a spot. He has become fearful. It happens there that he had just rescued his troublemaking nephew, Lot, from a coalition of several kings. Kings who were the superpowers of that day. Abraham has just made some very powerful enemies for himself. And because of that, he's afraid. So as we open Genesis 15, God, we see, very graciously appears to Abraham. And let's look at that. Moses says to us there in Genesis 15, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, Abram um, kind of immediately throws something right back in God. So he's not impressed by this, actually. Abram says in verse 2, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Now, what's going on there? Because Abraham and Sarah had no children, if Abraham were to die, everything that he owned would have gone to his chief servant, his steward, the person who managed all of his affairs for him. So Abraham kind of throws this back as a, as a jibe or a rebuke to God, if you will. Then verse 3, Abram says, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. 
And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. In case you were wondering what that picture was I had at the beginning. And he said to him, look at the stars, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. The Jewish people believed that Abraham had earned righteousness by doing good works, such as being willing to offer up Isaac to the Lord as a sacrifice, but they were mistaken. Now, Paul says in Romans 4, verse 4, he says, when you work, your wages are not counted to you as a gift, but as your due. What's he talking about? What does that have to do with Abraham? In other words, Paul is saying, when you receive your paycheck, at the end of the week, your boss doesn't hand your paycheck to you and say, here, here is a gift for you. You would look at your boss a little funny if he said that. Why? Because if you worked for something, that means you earned it. It is rightfully yours, right? So many dollars times X number of hours, that's what you are due. It's what's owed to you. And Paul is saying there, Abraham has done no work that would cause God to owe him anything. He had done nothing that would let him say to God, God, I demand that you consider me righteous. After all, it's only fair after what I've done for you. On the contrary, what had Abraham done? Abraham had simply believed the promise of God concerning his future and the future of his family. Abraham had done no works in order to be saved. He simply believed the word of the Lord that was coming to him. And God in that moment declared him to be righteous. So Paul is showing the enemies of the gospel that they really didn't understand what Abraham did that resulted in his being declared righteous by God. Not only did they not understand what Abraham did, Paul also shows them that they hadn't considered when Abraham was considered righteous. In verse 9, Paul says, we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. In other words, not works. And how then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It wasn't after, but it was before he was circumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith when he was still uncircumcised. You see, the Jewish people believed at that time that they were acceptable to God because they were in a covenant with him and because they had been circumcised, showing that they were in the covenant. But Paul reminds them that Abraham was circumcised many years after he was declared to be righteous, after he was justified. Actually, their calculation was that Abraham was circumcised maybe as much as almost 30 years after God declared him to be righteous. And so Paul is saying that the fact that he was circumcised was only a sign of something that it already had. It didn't do anything for him. Are you with me? So much to the chagrin of Paul's adversaries, Abraham's life, even Abraham's life experience shows us that circumcision does not save us and neither, for that matter, do good works save us. Rather, we are justified by faith. Paul has proven something else there that's extremely important for the defense of the gospel. Paul has demonstrated that this is not something new that he has invented. It's not something new to the word of God. It's not something novel that he has fabricated. On the contrary, the case of Abraham shows us that salvation has always been by grace. In Abraham's day, they were looking forward to the cross. We who live nowadays, we can look back to the cross. But in both cases, it is the merits of Jesus Christ and not our own merits that cause us to be declared righteous by God. Justification by faith alone. It's how God has always saved people. 
I told you this was meat, right? Anybody need to like, you know, let out a button or anything or you want to take a breath? Okay, praise the Lord. But this is good stuff and we need to get a grip on it. Church, it's been true in every age and it's been true no matter how many good works we've done. No one can say that they merit salvation, but all must go through the door of Christ. So Paul would write in his letter to Titus. Titus, by the way, is a great little letter that I, I guess we'll probably get to in another 12 years or so. <laughs> but Paul would write in his letter to Titus, he would say, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So the first lesson we can draw from Abraham, the father of our faith, is that even the best of us must be justified by faith and not by works. The second lesson is this. Even the worst of us can be justified by faith. Even the worst of us can be justified by faith. If Abraham was proof that moral people need to be saved by the grace of God through faith, then what can we say about those who have committed dreadful sins? Paul's going to tell us that it's the same thing. Paul reaches back again into the Old Testament for another example of what he's teaching them. And he shows them that King David was also justified by faith. David was counted righteous through the mercies of God and not through any merit of his own. So Paul shows us again that being justified by faith is not a new invention. And he's also showing us at the same time that there is a hope from God for people who know that they are great sinners. You probably remember the story of how David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Then he committed murder in an effort to cover up his crimes. Church, look, even 3,000 years ago, the cover-up was already worse than the crime. Amen? <laughs> but in verse 6 of Romans 4, Paul says... David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, saying, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's a quote from Psalm 32. And Psalm 32 is a passage where David is giving us insight into his own heart, telling us how miserable he was before he confessed his sin. And he's telling us how he came to experience that blessedness of being forgiven. How were David's lawless deeds forgiven and his sins sent away? What did David do so that the Lord would not count his sin against him. Let's look at what David himself said in Psalm 32. In verse 5, David says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now notice what he says there. David did no good works in an effort to try to balance the scales in his favor. You know, that's a very common idea, isn't it, that people have about salvation, and yet we find no support for it within the word of God. Neither did David punish himself in order to make up for what he had done. The word of God knows nothing of such ideas, and within the Bible, you will never find the idea of penance or purgatory. Instead, all we see is David confessing his sin and placing his confidence where? Solely in the mercy of God. He was counted righteous, not by anything he had done, because what he had done was pretty miserable. You know, if you do something and people are still talking about it 3,000 years later, you know it was bad. <laughs> he was counted righteous, not by by anything he had done, but by a deliberate act of God in his mercy, declaring him to be just, to be in right standing with God. And Paul wants you to see there's two sides to this coin. I don't know if you caught it, but notice God did not credit sin to David's account. And at the same time, God did count righteousness to him, not having anything to do with his works. Now, church, listen, this was an offensive idea in Paul's day, and it still remains offensive today. 
mankind in our pride. Mankind does not ever want to think that righteous people like Abraham can't be saved by their good works. And it also offends people that the wicked like David can be saved without being righteous. But Paul has already taught us that before God, no one can boast. Abraham might be able to boast in front of men, but Paul says not in front of God. He, like everyone, needs the righteousness that only comes from God. So whether you are moral or a murderer, we know that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But the good news is that no matter who we are or what we've done, Paul says, we can be justified freely by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What a great encouragement that is, church. If we could only lay that pride down, if people could lay that pride down and hope in Christ alone for salvation, we can know if we do that. We can experience that blessedness that David was talking about, saying, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. The first lesson we can draw from Romans 4 is that even the best of us must be justified by faith. The second lesson is that even the worst of us can be justified by faith. And the third lesson is this. Righteousness is credited to us when we believe in the one who justifies the ungodly. Now that is a mouthful. Let me say that again. Righteousness is credited to us when we believe in the one who justifies the ungodly. Paul says in verse 5, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Man doesn't like to think that God forgives the wicked, but to the religious Jews of Paul's day, this last part was particularly shocking and offensive. Why? Because here in this verse, Paul dares to describe God as the one who justifies the ungodly. And this is offensive because it certainly ran contrary to their picture of a holy God. And maybe it runs contrary to your picture of a holy God also. You know that in the Old Testament, God had actually literally said that he would in no way clear the guilty. But through the death of Christ upon the cross, God has solved our predicament. And yet at the same time, you know that at the cross, God was solving his own unique dilemma. You say, Pastor Nick, how can God have a dilemma? He's God. But God did have a dilemma that could only be solved at the cross. What was God's dilemma? God's dilemma is that he must punish the wickedness of man. And yet in his heart of love and mercy, his great desire was that man should be saved and restored into fellowship with him. But how can God pardon the guilty and still be a holy God who punishes evil? If man cannot deserve to be declared righteous, then how can God ever declare him righteous? In his great wisdom, God's solution was the cross. We've seen before that Jesus Christ was a propitiation, a sacrifice to take away wrath. How many of you know that in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul tells us that God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. Praise God. Come on, you ought to give God praise for that. And why did God do that? Paul tells us in Romans 3. He did this so that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Because of the cross, God can be both at the same time. And only when we trust in the God who sent his son to bear our sins, only then will we ourselves be acquitted. Church, put your thinking cap on here with, I know you already you probably have four thinking caps on at this point, but think with me about this. A God who would allow people 
who have fallen short of his glory, to say that they had earned a place in his glory, he would no longer be the God of glory. He would be a God who had cheapened his own glory and lowered his own standards of holiness. And he would be a God who owed you something. And a God, by the same token, who would let the guilty go free without punishing sin would not be a holy God either. He would be a moral monster who allowed injustice to triumph. But now because Jesus Christ has died in our place and suffered God's wrath against sin, God can be both just and the justifier of those who trust in Christ at the same time. God can forgive people as a sheer act of his mercy rather than as a debt that he owes anybody and still be just in the process. Praise God. Paul says, jumping back to verse 5, that if you don't work to be saved, but instead believe in the one who pardons the ungodly, your faith will be counted as righteousness. God will pardon you, and God will declare you righteous. You didn't generate this righteousness yourself. You didn't earn it in any way, but it's still getting credited into your checkbook nonetheless. Thank God. It's a righteousness that is foreign to you, but God is adding it to your ledger anyway. You say, well, Pastor Nick, there's something about that that makes me feel uneasy. There's something about that that doesn't quite seem particularly fair. And you're right. It isn't fair at all. If you and I were to receive what was fair, that would be justice. And we would all be in a lot of trouble. But church, listen. It certainly wasn't fair either for Christ to endure what he endured for me. But he endured it for my sake. He endured it for love's sake so that I could hear the Father say that I could go free, so that I could hear his voice saying, you are justified, you are declared righteous, praise God. And thank God the gospel tells us about a God who is willing to justify the ungodly. He's a God who offers mercy to the undeserving. Other religions have gods that offer mercy to the deserving. We have the only God who is willing to justify the ungodly. And he can do it and still be holy because Jesus has borne his wrath. The great old English preacher Charles Spurgeon explained it like this. He said, see what Christ has done in his living and his dying. His acts becoming our acts and his righteousness being counted to us so that we are rewarded as if we are righteous while he was punished as if he had been guilty. Four lessons from Abraham's story. And the last lesson is this. Worship team, you can come back please if you would. The last lesson is this, all of us can receive God's righteousness by faith. All of us can receive God's righteousness by faith. Back in verse 3 of chapter 4, Paul says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul says that righteousness is available for everybody, both Jew and Gentile. And because of that, Abraham is the father of faith for all of us because he was counted righteous before he could do any good works, just like you and me. And he was justified long before he became the father of the Jews. So if you think about it with me like this, Abraham, it turns out, was actually the first Gentile to be justified by faith. Paul's point throughout chapters 3 and 4 is that it doesn't matter who you are. You can have God declare you to be both forgiven and justified. This is what we need, every single one of us. We need a pardon. And we then need a declaration that we've been put in right standing with God. Sin has separated us from God. And we need to come home to Him. Today, I want to encourage somebody here. I want to encourage you to give up thinking that you can earn your salvation. 
I also want to encourage somebody here to stop thinking that you're too far gone or that it's too late. See, the Word of God shows us a God who says to us, come and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them to be as white as snow. What can we do to be justified? The gospel teaches us, and the lives of these Old Testament heroes of the faith, Abraham and David, teach us the truth. My religious training might have taught me that I need to do penance to get into God's good graces. My personal inclination may be to think that my good works are going to entitle me to look God in the eye and tell him that I've earned a spot in his heaven. My human pride may lead me to think that someday when I'm ready, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to reform myself and I'll be okay somehow in the end because after all, I've lived a pretty good life. But none of those human efforts is a work that can justify me in the face of a holy God. You know, Jesus talked about this back in the Gospels. If you go back to John chapter 6, there was a big crowd of people that were following Jesus around. And some people asked him, Jesus, what shall we do in order to be working the works of God? You know what Jesus said? Jesus answered them and said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one that he has sent. What a statement. That's the only work that God requires. And it's also the only work that God accepts. The work that God accepts is that we believe in the one that he sent. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking about turning over that new leaf. Jesus said it's not about you turning over a new leaf. It's about you having a new birth. We can never make ourselves by our own efforts into the sons and daughters of God. But the scripture promises us that as many as received him, I want you to say it, say received him. As many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. And when we trust in Christ, he will declare us to be both pardoned and to be righteous. Even the best of us needs the righteousness that he offers and even the worst of us can have it. We can receive it when we believe on the one who wants to justify the ungodly. And it is freely offered to all who believe. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So church, let's follow in Abraham's footsteps today. And let's by faith receive the gift of eternal life from a merciful God. Come on, would you stand together with me? Give Jesus a hand of praise in his house today. Thank you.